Uh, we are going to resume our program, and we are very fortunate to have a panel discussion among some of the members of the uh, Global Commission. And that uh, panel discussion is going to be led by the premier political panelist, and no, he's not the political panelist, he has political panels. He has the premier political show in the country, and yes, that's right. And, uh, <laughs> and he's got fans here tonight, too. Uh, so please welcome, and he will introduce you to the panelists, please welcome the CBC's Evan Solomon. I will spend the rest of my life following Don Newman, so lower your expectations. I could do worse. Um, first of all, Don, thank you. Um, I'm glad Don didn't speak too much right there because um, I've asked him, and I've been, I've, it's been difficult to uh, follow Don Newman on television. Uh, I've asked him for five years to lend me an octave in my voice, and he's not done that. He, he has maintained it. Um, it's great to be here tonight. Um, this is going to be a really interesting discussion, and I'm going to introduce the guests. We're going to have about uh, 45 minutes of discussion. Uh, then we'll have questions from the floor. Uh, if you know Don, if you know Canada 2020, if you know Jim Balsilli, the founder of CG, you'll know they like engaging questions. You know they like a robust discussion. Uh, this is like a kitchen table discussion, uh, and Derek Bernie's here. That means... Um, it better be good. <laughs> I'll introduce the, uh, our distinguished panel the, uh, to talk about the Global Commission on Internet, Internet Governance. And I just want to say one word. Um, if w I, like many people here, I just got back from the Halifax Security Forum, excellent forum um, on security issues. One of the big issues was on uh, security issues as it relates to the Internet uh, and cyber issues. Uh, there are uh, issues in terms of cybersecurity, there are issues in terms of cyber warfare, there are in, um, issues in terms of surveillance issues here. Uh, it affects business, it affects citizens. Um, this is, people always wonder if we're at the front line. We live on the front line now of a much more serious um, battle that's going on, and I choose that word carefully. It is a battle, um, and it requires serious thinking. So tonight, we'll get a good perspective on it. Let me introduce the chair of the commission. Carl Bildt, who I had the pleasure of, of speaking with on my program the other day, Sweden's prime minister, of course, from 91 to 94, foreign minister from 2006 until earlier this year. He's a renowned diplomat, although he, I hope he's not as diplomatic this evening. He's also served as the EU Special Envoy to the former Yugoslavia, the High Representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina, UN Special Envoy to the Balkans, co-chairman of the Daytona Peace Conference, and that's just the beginning. Give a warm welcome to Mr. Carl Bildt. Also joining us tonight, Melissa Hathaway is a former White House cybersecurity czar, quote unquote. I know, I know. She serves, Zarina, she served two U.S. presidential administrations. She spearheaded the Cyberspace Policy Review for President Obama and led the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative for President George W. Bush. She's a CG Distinguished Fellow and President of Hathaway Global Strategies. Please welcome Melissa Hathaway. Melissa. I want to welcome Moaz Chakchuk is the chairman and the CEO of the Tunisian Internet Agency, the primary internet service provider in Tunisia. He is an engineer by training and a senior advisor to the Minister of Communications, Moaz. And finally, Latha Reddy is India's former deputy national security advisor, secretary, of the National Security Council Secretariat from 2011 to 2013. Before that, she had a long career as a diplomat in the Indian Foreign Service and served as India's ambassador to Portugal and Thailand and the Consul General in Durban, South Africa. Latha Reddy, please welcome her. All right. Now, uh, we're going to talk cybersecurity, although I know many people want to talk 
talk about any other issues. I'll just tell you right now, no questions about the CBC. <laughs> All right, questions about the CBC. This is pretty funny to John Newman. Um, I'm going to start with you, Carl. Um, you and I had a, a fascinating conversation. Um, and I want to go down the line first because part of what we, the first step in this is to realize why a commission like this is even necessary in the first place. Uh, people might wonder that there's you know, the issues I spoke about, cyber warfare, down the surveillance, censorship, hack and check, a long list of what could go wrong online. What's the purpose of the commission? And I guess another way of saying that is, what keeps you awake at night? Well, not, I'm, I'm most people get, uh, most things keep me awake at night. But it, essentially, to say that the internet has developed into the world's most important infrastructure. But it's developed fairly sort of incrementally from uh, community of nerds and academics and technicians and whatever, and suddenly it is the infrastructure of the world. And accordingly, there are quite a number of conversations that are coming into it, and quite a number of governments that suddenly take an interest. And then there is an, then there's a failure in necessity, I think, to try to form some sort of more coherent global consensus on how to manage these particular different issues. Because people are waking up all over the world in a positive and negative way to the importance of the debt for the development of the political system and the economic system and the social development. And thus, we want to facilitate that particular dialogue and try to be instrumental in forging whatever we can in terms of a global consensus. I'm just going to come back to quickly before I go down. This is the Global Commission on Internet Governance. How do you govern something? I mean, we always talk about control and lack of control. What does governance actually mean? And, and, and because, you know, there's a large movement of people who resist the very notion of it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. The governance is, of course, a particular term that is difficult to translate into other languages, by the way. We have no corresponding word in French or German or Swedish, for that matter. Uh, it's not government. It is governance. And the governance, as we sometimes say, is done by an ecosystem of different structures. The multi-stakeholder approach, which is a fairly technical term, can be translated into saying that no single interest should be able to dominate the net. But all interests are, should be have a say in the way in which it's run. That's a fairly complicated concept that we try to cover in that particular term that is governance. It's not government, it's governance, and it's an ecosystem of different structures. Lath, I, I want to ask the same question with you, but you know that I want to keep coming back to this notion of governance because outside in, the, in what they call real world, in our own uh, sovereign borders, we have real debates, we have wars about normative behavior. The institutions of governance like the UN are themselves in crisis to legitimize normative values and standards. And we look at situations like in Ukraine that are challenging these very norms. What does a global commission on internet, gov internet governance mean for you? Well, I think, you know, that governance and government, as Carl said, are very different things. And um, in fact, the motto of the new government in India today is more governance, less government. Mm -hmm. By which they mean you cut down the bureaucracy, but you have better systems of running the country. And I think that's what we should really try for in uh, internet uh, governance. We should try to find a better way to run it, by which we keep the interconnectedness, we keep the open nature of the internet, we let everyone have unlimited access to it, but at the same time, you make it uh, safe and secure. So this is a delicate balance, you know, the balance between trying to ensure safety for your citizens in this very important medium which really governs our lives, and at the same time, respect privacy, respect individual rights, expect, you know, respect the rights of the uh, citizen. The same citizen will want these rights, but will also expect a secure environment in which to operate. So that's where I think governance comes in. And I'll ask you that second question. What is your greatest concern 
uh, as a challenge to the, the kind of governance that you envision? I think the, the greatest challenge is that all of us are aware that critical information infrastructures, by which I mean very vital sectors in each country, can come under attack. This could include sectors like the power structure in your country, aviation, the transport networks like the railways, it could be nuclear, it could be space, it could be defense installations. So I think from the point of view of governments, and I think also from the point of view of citizens, it's very important to ensure that these very vital assets are guarded against cyber attacks. But this is one side of the picture. But as I said, the rights of the individual, the right to privacy, these are very important issues that you have to keep in mind when you're looking at the other aspect. Moaz, from your, your perspective, um, and, and a very unique perspective because it's played a role very much uh, in some of the social developments in your country, what, what do you make of, of, of governance issues and how that plays out in different parts of the world? First of all, you, you have to know that uh, there is some translation of the word governance in different languages, but the problem is how we consider this governance uh, for when we try to develop uh, and when we try to give opportunities to all people to develop, uh, to give opportunities to develop the internet and make products or products. Uh, Moaz, hold on. Can everyone hear Moaz? Okay. No. Moaz, I'm gonna, we're going to do a, a fix. Can you flip your microphone to this side there or to the center? Okay. Just put it on your top. Okay. Yeah. It's okay? okay. Yeah. No. We're just hacking the uh, microphone here. Go ahead. That's okay. So the idea, oh, was it? Okay. The idea is to be the opportunity to Here we come. Watch this. Watch this. We have an immediate AV situation. Here we come. All right. I can, I can take We, uh, I, I should yeah. report that our system has been brought down, but don't worry. It's been hacked. You are going to see some resilience here, and Moaz is going to get back at it. Uh, Moaz, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So I say that there is some translation of the word governance, but the problem is how we understand this word and how we make it effective for development of the internet. You, you know, in different countries around the world, and including my country, uh, before the revolution, we have the the definition of governance that means control. You know, we need, we need to control everything related to the internet because we always highlight that the issue of risks and the issue of security, as I just mentioned before. I think uh, what is important for this, for this commission is just we, we trying to, to give the right definition of this governance and to solve those issues in a global manner. It's not just a country experience that is, that is worthy, but it is very important to, to highlight different experiences and to share all our knowledge about it, because the issues cannot be solved by one country, it cannot be solved by one organization, it will be solved by all of us together. All right, and, and let's get to that. Le Melissa, obviously the U.S. has a perspective, just, a, I mean, I don't know if everyone saw when Obama announced that they were going to give up some control of the internet, Newt Gingrich said in a tweet, quote, every American should worry about Obama giving up control of the internet to an undefined group. This is very, very dangerous. Right. <laughs> I mean, just quoting Newt Gingrich, which I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not giving a perspective on. Who's this undefined group? I mean, what are the concerns around these governance issues in the U.S.? Uh, well, I can't comment to Newt Gingrich, so, um, but uh, <clears throat> that evil place that we're going to give it up to. Actually, you know, the United States gave up the internet a long time ago as when we created it in 69 and it really spread to Europe and the rest of the world in 72 and has transposed into this critical service that affects all critical infrastructures and has changed the way we live, work, and play. And, and that's why we all talk about the internet today, of what does it mean and why do we need to have power control, freedom, democracy, openness, interoperability, is because we all have become addicted and we all actually must have the internet because it's a compelled participation. If you want your lights to be on, your water to run, his uh, AV not to be jammed, then we need to, you know, we need the internet to work. And um, uh, can you imagine a day that you're, you can actually tweet, get your email, and or, uh, you know, have your particular day of life? But what does governance mean? 
I mean, in the US, in Canada, in India, Tunisia, Sweden, or China. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, those are very different perspectives. I mean, how do we find some normative standards where the internet is used in very different ways, and then there's different threats and security issues that that, that raises? So I think governance should be is defined in a lot of different ways, as we've all said, because the language doesn't translate um, across our cultures. And I think we need to think about it as, uh, what would tomorrow look like if you didn't have the internet in your country? And that fragmentation is something that none of us can live with. And it's a question of what part of it do we want to control? For some of us, we want to monetize the internet and continue to see the GDP growth and limit the GDP erosion because of crime, fraud, intellectual property theft, identity theft, or however we just find it in our country. For others, we want to assure access for our citizens because it enables that GDP growth. Whereas still others are looking at as the political power and control of their ability to project power and become a world leader because they've actually been able to use that platform to project their messages to attract the world to their particular uh, points of view. So when we think about the internet and the governance, we're all talking about different things of what's important to our particular countries. But I think we all agree that we don't want it to fragment as it goes forward. Okay, let, let's talk about that. What are the threats to this kind of fragmentation? Here in Ottawa, we had the police services who were recently hacked. We all know about the group Anonymous that seems to have tremendous power. We know in the US, classified systems have been hacked, or, or sorry, unclassified systems have been hacked. Unclassified People are, systems. And unclassified, that's right. Well, yeah. I mean, we're, we're living in the post-Snowden world of the post-WikiLeaks world. We know this. Uh, Carl Bill, uh, how do we, give us an assessment of how serious those threats are and then how consequential the response is, what kind of responses are required in a world where we see that? I think the, the threats are indeed serious and I think it's very important that we are aware of the threats and that we all take the measures that are necessary. I mean, that might apply to governments who are securing their sort of vital communication systems, that's fairly obvious, but also the individual, when we sort of safeguard our individual passwords, that we prevent our computers from being used by criminals because they can easily hijack your computer and use it for ends that you don't want to be part of. So individual responsibility and individual awareness of every single, on every single level, I think is uh, essential. So public awareness of the dangers that are there is the number one response. Then there are a lot of technical and other issues that needs to be sorted out. But what are your expectations? When, I, when Carl Bell was on my program, I asked him, if you traveled to China, and you said you hadn't been there recently, but yeah. if you had, yeah. out, even as a politician, you said you carried a, a separate black barrier device because you had the expectation of being hacked. But if you traveled there in your current position, as a private citizen, would you have the expectation that your data would be breached? I would have the expectation that uh, there would be the possibility of them trying to control what I have. And, the, uh, and then I would be careful what I put on the net or in my communications. Yes, I would. Uh, I would not carry any sort of secure government or other uh, devices uh, in such countries. In China, is often mentioned, but I wouldn't say that China is the only case where that is uh, that needs to be taken into account. Okay, well, well, Latha, listen to that. Is there should people have the expectation that when you travel, governments are dipping into your data? And well, I mean, governments dipping in, dipping in. Um, uh, there are certain governments that are very keen to restrict your freedom of information and your freedom of expression, and you know roughly which these governments are. Then I think there is. You want to name them, Carl Bill? Well, China, <laughs> North Korea, to be one. I mean, yeah. to take an obvious example, or China might be another one, and there might be, or there are quite certain, quite a number of other ones. Then sometimes these fears are somewhat exaggerated, in the sense that uh, there's the fear that there's a mass surveillance by governments. That is often not the case, because it's a bloody difficult thing to do. Right. Um, so you don't need to be scared all the time for everything, uh, but uh, if you are really want to protect sort of national security secrets, yeah, don't put them on the net, I would say, if you're not in very secure systems. <laughs> but if you're an ordinary citizen, I wouldn't say that you need to be that concerned. Laughing. 
Well, I, I think I'd agree with Carl there because I don't think that every single person who travels to a country is going to be, uh, you know, spied upon or that their uh, website or their email is going to be necessarily hacked. But um, I think it depends on how, how sensitive a position you're in. Mm. And I think if you do work in a sensitive position in government or if you know that the country you're going to has got very diametrically opposite views and you've been an embarrassment to that country, yes, I would think that you'd have a reasonable expectation. And when I was working on the cybersecurity policy, someone asked me what I'd learned. And I said, what I learned was to never put anything that was really confidential on the internet. Mm. And I think that's true. But I would. Oh, 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 oh. On that, I, I want to make sure everyone gets a chance in there because it's a, it's a difficult balance because here in Canada, for example, we're in a heightened moment of awareness about security issues, as we all uh, realize, most particularly here in Ottawa. But every country has, I mean, look, in India, you've had that, in Tunisia, and obviously the US. Um, these are very, the citizens have an expectation, Moaz, of, of what is that expectation of where governments um, are needing to have security and surveillance, and where people can have the expectation of privacy. The situation is different from a developed country to a developing country because we, we know that very well that the situation in, in a developing country is not as as enough to develop it because we know that uh, the security issues are really highlighted by the government, but at the same time we don't have a lot of applications and a lot of content, and uh, we, this is not reflect the real needs of of, of the nature, uh, users actually. Because when we see, for example, the statistics today mentioned by CG, and we see that 28% of Tunisians have heard about Snowden, it's really uh, impressive because a lot of people talking here about Snowden regulations and so on. And if what, when we hear about that, that Tunisian, for example, 50% of the Tunisians are concerned about their privacy, this is very, very, very uh, different than the other countries in the developed world. So we need to consider this differently because what we want to highlight today for developing countries is that we need to develop our applications, we need to develop our internet, we need, we need to bring much more opportunities to people. And this is, cannot be on the price of the security and uh, highlight a lot of risks in our countries, means that we are losing somehow some opportunities in developing our uh, network. I'll pick up on, on that later. Uh, uh, though, but, but let's do, can we pick up on the U.S. perspective on that in the post-Snowden NSA world? Where, where, where's that argument? Which argument? Uh, on surveillance and the balance between security, uh, privacy, the civil liberties argument uh, about where we're going in terms of protecting ourselves and, and, and our information. So I think that we're in a, an era of heightened awareness of what government capabilities are globally, not just the United States. And I think it was startling for our citizens to appreciate what those capabilities were and how they're being used for the protection of our freedoms and, um, and the stability for our countries. I think there is a new debate that's going on about privacy and about surveillance and, and really about the collection of data regarding ourselves. And it's not just about what our governments are collecting, it's about what our companies are collecting and the dossiers that they could have on, e on each of us. And I could argue that Google knows a lot more about me and my habits than the FSB of Russia or you know, the intelligence service of China. And the fact that they could sell it to any bidder is quite bothersome. What do you do to stop that? What are we going to do to stop well, that? What can you do? I mean, it is well, I think that what um, I think actually Europe right now is leading the conversation about what is the responsibility for major corporations in handling our data and data privacy and data protection. I think we should think about it like the way that we did of the and I'll, it's a maybe a negative term, but the robber barons or you know the industrial barons of the of the company towns and that you had no other choice. We have limited choice in what we have for the products and services and the fact that you have to opt in to give away all of your private data for their free and unfettered use is something that perhaps requires government intervention. Talk, talk, look, maybe Lath, I'll, I'll start with you on that or whoever wants to weigh in. 
on uh, net neutrality, this notion that uh, Obama has come out very strongly in, in favor of net neutrality and advised the Federal Communications Commission uh, that should rule all internet traffic should be cr treated equally. How, how is that playing out around the world? What is, to you, what is net neutrality? How does that issue play out? Well, I think that um, it, it's a fact that because there's worries that uh, big players in the, uh, in the internet world could start to charge very high prices for quicker services, for instance. And it actually goes back to the history of telecommunications because telephone services, for example, are not charged or were not charged till private players came into the business at different charges for different people. You know, everyone who had a telephone paid the same charges in a particular country. And the same principle was, in a sense, followed by the original internet service providers because they were also telecom companies to begin with. But it's when the independent players have come in and now with the idea that you can get accelerated services for different prices, this puts a lot of the smaller companies who can't pay the very high charges to get that special treatment. It puts them at a disadvantage. So that's what net neutrality, the argument's all about. So it is a debate in India as well. And in fact, in India, it's the opposite because we have so many people who are providing very cheap services. Right. So the established players argue that, you know, in this case, the net neutrality works against them because an Indian supplier is able to give it at a rock bottom price. I mean, you can get free incoming calls all month long and, um, you know, pay just a pittance for making your outgoing calls and yet an established telecom provider has to charge a certain amount because he has overheads. So it can't be a totally neutral marketplace. So it is a very, very fascinating debate at the moment, the whole question of net neutrality. Anyone can weigh in on that. I want to get to security in one more minute, but just on that, here in Canada, I think every telecom, every environment, outside of the US to a certain extent, Certainly in Canada, we're, we're concerned, uh, we have a lot of hearings at what we call our CRTC uh, about Canadian content. And once <coughs> the internet, there's a convergence issue, uh, that people can get their data, their stories from anywhere. And there is a question about how cultures, do you become part of this overall culture, this globalized culture, or how do you protect your own industries and your own stories? Uh, in a way, how does the governance issue play into that, allowing uh, what, what some countries might see as protectionist barriers in a, in a free trade world, uh, and yet there are industry and there are cultural issues at stake? Anyone want to take a swipe at that? Carville? We have an element of that debate in Europe. That sounds very yeah. French to me. LAUGHTER uh, uh, because it, that's usually the, the, the argument that we have across. That's a compliment here in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I'm quite certain that it was meant as that, yeah. uh, which I think you understood. But I mean, we, 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 normally, we normally say that we are not that afraid because I, we think the quality of our culture is enough to defend itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and uh, while we've had a debate in Europe where the one should have in the relationship with the US uh, the special protections for special cultures, some people want it, the French notably, most of us others say that I, I think we are confident in the strength of our culture. Uh, the more we have accessibility, the more we have the freedom, the more it will be the possibility for that to assert itself with the people that are really interested. So the question of the extent of confidence that you have in your own culture and your own identity. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, Moaz. We have experienced a lot of censorship during, during the regime of Ben Ali. And we know very well that uh, if we want to promote the internet and if we want to promote good speech, we need to promote openness. We need to promote free, free speech and, and also to, to bring new ideas on the way of maintaining that some contents are not accessible from our children, for example, or whatever. So I think bringing these ideas in the, in the stage is very important because we have this, this debate just after the revolution because the last decision made by Ben Ali is to open the network completely, the internet, for, for the country. And 
then when we flew out of the country, he was somehow complicated to maintain the, free, the, the open internet because a lot of people brung, brought ideas about we need to censor something on the internet because of our culture, because of our religion, because yeah. of our habits. But uh, I think the, the discussion went very well because it was like um, a debate showing that when we censor something, that means that you are promoting it anyway. So if you, want, if, the, if you don't want this content, you need to keep it and try to ignore it. Now there's two microphones that um, I can't see. They're roving. If you've got a question, do you have a question over there? Oh, there's one there. Uh, there are two, so we've got about uh, you know, 20 minutes left. Uh, put up your hand, we'll get you uh, a microphone and you can begin with a question. Um, the other question is cyber uh, warfare. We talk about security, cyber warfare. You and I spoke about this. Uh, everyone read about Stuxnet. Uh, widely reported in the public domain, though probably in a room like this there's a better understanding of it, and if you want to share that with me off the record privately, <laughs> that would be fantastic. Um, widely reported that it was the US and the Israelis that designed a kind of cyber attack on the Iranians, and obviously deep concern about their nuclear program there, and Stuxnet. How prevalent will cyber warfare be and what does that talk about the rules of engagement where you're attacking another country through cyber warfare like that as Carl Bill? Well, um, clearly we discussed it somewhat yesterday, but I mean this is states operating cyber warfare against other states. Right. It's a dangerous thing, and it is warfare, and it should fall under the same rules as the laws of war. But clearly this needs to be further elaborated and I think it's one of the discussions that we're going to have in our com commission in the next few months. But, but let, let me add another point which should not for, be forgotten when you talk about the different dangers that might be there and which worries me, I mean what keeps me awake at night, and that is the explosion of criminality on the net. Uh, we're talking about states misusing perhaps right. or using the net in ways which not entirely be to our liking but a lot of criminal activity is going on there. And that is dangerous. Yeah. And we need to safeguard ourselves against that in different ways. That being said, uh, I wouldn't say that that is something specific to the net. Right. The net is a reflection of society. There's a lot of good in society. There's a fair amount of evil in society. People are murdered in the streets, and they're robbed in the streets, and banked or robbed. Yeah. And the same things happen on the net. But we need to be aware of the fact that the same criminals are on the net. And uh, we as individuals need to take care of the security and the safety of our communication in order to block the criminals in the same way as we lock our cars or carefully the streets or whatever we do. So it's, uh, we should be aware of it but not say it's unique to the net, it's but a reflection of society. And fair enough, there's crime, but, but there's also these cyber attacks, which you said, I'm fascinated oh, by yeah. what you said about this rules of warfare and, and how they apply at the Halifax conference, the head of the NSA just sort of dropped out uh, a fact that in military circles was widely known, but it was interesting to hear it publicly, oh, the Chinese could take down the grid any time, but don't worry, we can take it down too. You know, and everyone was kind of like, oh. You know. <laughs> it was nice to know that the mutually assured destruction is, is alive and well. Uh, but but yeah. how does this apply? Anybody else want to weigh in on, on cyber warfare? Melissa? So I, I think that um, the use of uh, the military grade weapon against Iran's ability to create a nuclear weapon was the beginning of a mass proliferation of capability. And it's something that should concern all of us because there are no mechanisms as such to control the proliferation of these capabilities. As you know, you know that particular um, uh, payload or package was widely studied and you've seen uh, variations of it. So it's not just the Stuxnet, it's the sons and daughters of Stuxnet, you know, whether it's Shamoon or it's uh, Dooku, and I could go on and on. And, um, and I perhaps worry um, less on somebody taking down a nation state, taking down the power grid, than um, one of those weapons being used against one of our major corporations as a proxy that's just short of warfare. And so when you saw the 
the weapon used against Saudi Aramco that destroyed 70% of its IT assets. Yeah. That was a material event for a corporation, right? And that was a wake-up call for all boardrooms all around the world of what and how vulnerable are we. And for countries, it started to, to pose the question of a change of the critical industries of, you know, if we had taken off Saudi Aramco and it hit the oil production as it was, as I think the weapon was intended to, that would have affected 10% of the world's oil production and more than 25% of liquid natural gas. And that would have been an economic crisis for all of us with just one company. That we all as nations have a responsibility to address it and all of our corporations also have a responsibility to understand how vulnerable they are. Where, where are we on that fight? I mean, this is something that you spent a lot. I mean, when you say we have a responsibility to, to uh, protect ourselves against that, uh, where's the doomsday clock on, or where are we? I don't, the doomsday cloud. I think that we all have the responsibility to have um, a conversation about what's going on. And I don't think our governments are saying enough about what's happening to our countries, and I don't think our companies are talking about anything that's happening to their infrastructures and enterprises. And until we have a transparent conversation about what's really happening, we won't get to practical solutions to reduce our risk and to restore our resilience. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in on vulnerabilities to things like financial markets, which have a material effects like as well? I'd like to talk in that. You know, I, I think the real issue is you've got different layers. Let's look at even financial issues. The average user is worried that his bank account could be tampered with, that money could be embezzled. Banks are worried that their credibility will suffer if there's an attack on their system and their customers or clients suffer, right? Governments are worried because the collapse of the financial system at a macro level could really affect the country in a very fundamental way. So I think the real point is that on some of these issues there has to be what we call PPP, you know, public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. And this is something which I think we all have to recognize that governments can't do it alone, industry can't do it alone, and individuals can't do it alone. It has to be a very open conversation between all three levels to talk about how we're going to handle these threats. And a very simple thing like, you know, people don't change their passwords. And you've got to educate the public that you change your password, have a password that's more, that would do away with a lot of the smaller attacks you see. But I agree with you that when you're looking at major attacks, we've talked about one state doing it to another, but we haven't talked about non-state actors. This is a very real problem. Yeah. Um, cyber terror attacks yeah, sure. and the, the, the whole of cyberspace being used to foment terrorist movements, for yeah. example. Huge. It's huge. So, you know, there's so many facets to this question of how cyber can be used in a negative way. But yeah. I think at the same time, we mustn't ever lose fact of the you know, do, lose sight of the fact that it's also such a great positive good. And we shouldn't start hedging ourselves around with too many firewalls because we're afraid. We somehow have to build those firewalls and yet remain open. Yeah. Listen, uh, you've got 15 minutes. Uh, so you've got to ask a question. Now, uh, <laughs> I have a two-hour program every night, so this is nothing for me. I can just go on all night. Um, as I like to say to Don, they got half the man but twice the time here when they replaced him. But uh, if the, you do have a question, and I'm looking at you, Mr. Bernie, uh, if you do have a question, um, do ask it, uh, I, because I, there is one, is there one over there? Okay, you got Okay, okay, there's one over here, Mr. Bernie, Derek Bernie, go ahead, hold on, let's wait to the microphone, not that you've ever needed it. <laughs> so, is it on? Yeah. Yes, sir. So we understand the distinction between government and governance. Okay, I think we understand. What's the objective? Are you, is this commission going to establish principles? Is it going to establish a consensus? Is it going to establish rules, non-rule rules? I mean, I'm a little ambiguous given the discussion today about what your objective is. We understand all the problems, and you've given us enough to keep ourselves awake for the rest of our lives with some of the problems that we face. 
but what is your objective? What, what are you trying to achieve here? Establishing, you're not doing government, you're doing governance, and that's kind of soft. So what does it mean? Where are you going? I think the objective is that you should be able to sleep at night without the fear of the internet going bust. Um, there are, uh, I mean, uh, it's simple as that. I mean, it's got to be, it is the world's most important infrastructure today. It will be even more important tomorrow for everything. Yeah. So we are going to all be dependent upon this thing working. And we want to establish some sort of global consensus on this should be handled. So that those who want to disrupt or destroy or degrade the system from whatever reasons that might be are blocked so that you and I and All the rest of us. of us can sleep at night and the net continues to be the powerful transformation of the world for the good that it's been so far. But practically how do you do it? But practically how you do it is that you establish a system of sort of ecosystem of governance that is broadly acceptable by all of the stakeholders and make it so, so anchored among all of the stakeholders that it can't be challenged, it can't be captured by anyone. That you also preserve the element of, uh, it's a very dynamic system. I mean, the internet is not what it used to be. I mean, there's some fundamentals that are there. You're trying to harness a technology that is evolving. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that we are way behind. We have, we, 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 have, we have a system of governance of the net at the moment, the multi-stakeholder approach that has been able to accommodate this enormous expansion, enormous expansion. Um, and it's a question of sort of seeing, can we adjust, can we anchor, can we uh, finesse this particular system so it's able to capture all of the stakeholders and isolate the spoilers, to be precise, Melissa in the future. Yeah. Meli Mo Melissa Moaz also. Yeah, don't Melissa Moaz. Right. Go ahead. I, okay. Uh, so I think of this as, um, you know, we're in a multilingual nation, and, um, and we just talked about that governance doesn't translate. But when I look at this as I look at this as it's a, it's a translation issue. And you might laugh at me, but it's sort of the, uh, the geeks versus the policy wonks. And what do we need? So how do you harness the technology when the policymakers don't actually necessarily understand the technology or the implications of the policies that may impact the future of the opportunity or the, the, the challenge? Yeah. So when I look at the commission, <clears throat> uh, I look at us as we're going to be and hope to be the master translators of the technology into policy and policy back into technology and help both sides understand what the implications of their set, set of decisions are. Mm -hmm. If our technologists are going one way and it has an impact on privacy or security, or our policymakers are going another way and it's the regulating or going in particular that's gonna stifle growth and innovation, we need to be able to, to take it either way and be the master translator of, of geek to wonk. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, so, and with that though, we all have a common goal of to, in the meantime, if, I'm the geek or you're the wonk or vice versa. I think I'd probably be the wonk. But um, that we don't fragment and don't make yeah. bad decisions. And um, But not many people know what the decisions and the right decisions or the implications of their decisions are. And you know, and I look at it having worked for two administrations and getting ready to help transition our government to another administration, getting it down to a simple story um, is difficult. And it's a simple story on why access matters. It's a simple story of why the technology and protocols matter and standards. It's a, it's a conversation about the social impacts and the social opportunity and education and learning. And those are five point papers, 15 point papers. You only have one page to read. What are the messages in that three paragraphs that are going to matter and stick and be a sticky story that's simple enough that makes you want more translation of the next set of stories? Yeah. There's two questions. I know everyone wants to weigh in. Uh, we're going to hang in. We're going to weigh in just for time. And great, great questions about what drives it: governance, wonks, technology itself, private. And this is the one industry that's galloping. There's a question over there. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering. What do you guys think of the current state of the export controls and regulations that are applied to companies in Western countries that might be selling um, uh, internet surveillance software or uh, hacking software? You know, what's your 
Yeah. 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 We, we, we were like, like um, a test bed for many companies around the world because Tunisia was very promoting a lot of surveillance equipment in the country. But at the same time, I think uh, today it is a right moment because we are dealing with those issues differently. We are bringing new ideas. And I think we, we are in, 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 in a position to state a new model to tackle all those issues, those security issues, without being uh, promoting surveillance in developing countries like mine. I think this is very important to, to control some of these six spots on, on, on around the world, but at the same time, if we don't bring ideas, if, if, if we don't solve the issues differently, we won't succeed to, to make this kind of control because everywhere we can uh, find a way to bypass it. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Carmel? Well, very briefly, we, we have in the European Union uh, decisions to prohibit sales of those equipment to certain regimes. And it's an ongoing debate on exactly which regimes and which technologies, but I mean, it's, uh, we are aware of that particular problem and we are taking actions, trying to take action. Lathi, you wanted to weigh in on that, I think the last point as well. Was that, was that right? Well, I've forgotten what the last point was. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Don't worry, it's somewhere on the internet. Uh, well, <laughs> there's another question here. I had a question that was more of just a pure internet governance question, and in particular, one of the internet governance questions du jour. I'm, I'm interested to hear the panel's opinions and thoughts on the current plans to transition the IANA oversight functions away from the, the uh, NTIA, and given everything that's going on in the world today, is, is now the right time for this? Or what, what's your views and opinions on this? Yeah, you. Who wants to weigh in? Laugh oh, or we're going to defer to you. <laughs> we have discussed this all day. We have yeah, discussed yeah. this all day. So. All day. So <laughs> yeah, accordingly, you can. I yeah. can. Okay. Go ahead, Lefa. I can or I can't. You, you, can. you, you can. You can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it has been discussed all day. And the idea is that what, as you all know, the idea is that I can should transition its stewardship of the INA functions. And that has to come up with some other alternative mechanism because the US Department of Commerce and the NTIA have indicated that if an acceptable alternative right. can be found, uh, it will not be supervising this any longer. Uh, it's a moot point whether by the, by the deadline of September 15, uh, September 2015, they can come up with an alternative system. So I think there is a transition process underway. They're looking at ways and means. There have been caveats entered by the US government that a, a system that's controlled by one government or a group of governments will not be accepted. Uh, but they want a system that is essentially multi-stakeholder in approach. But it's still very unclear what the ICANN is going to come up with as an alternative. And uh, the fact that it may or may not happen by September 2015, and also what is going to be plan B if there's no alternative coming up. I think these are the issues which are occupying everyone uh, today. This was hailed as uh, opening up of the system uh, by, the, by the US, but I think the caveats that have been entered make it almost impossible for a truly radically different system to evolve because and also the debate is not about the continuance of ICANN or uh, whether or not the ICANN should be incorporated in the US at the moment it's purely on the IANF transition but all of these are issues that are raked up in every internet governance debate. Anyone else want to? So well, I think they're all trying to come up with an alternative, uh, uh, acceptable alternative. But uh, in my personal opinion, I don't think it's going to be possible before September 2015. Yeah. Melissa, you want to weigh in? Yeah, uh, okay. uh, Melissa, go ahead, Melissa. go ahead. No, you go. Melissa, you go ahead, Melissa. OK, I just want to say that we actually, what is important for us is just we keep this working. Of course, the IANA functions are very essential to, 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 to imagine a, a very good transition, but the principles are really important. And what is stated by NTEA, I think it's very, very important for the future. 
So th this commission, I think, we're considering that very carefully, and we want to maintain that the internet could be resilient and could and could maintain it as efficient as as, as possible. And of course, we we are concerned about it, but that, at the same time, there is no deadline that could be respected if these uh, this principles are not uh, respected. Sure. Melissa. It's about the key performance parameters or the KPIs of the internet. First and foremost, you need to make sure that it remains stable in a transition period. You want it to become more transparent because that's one of the criticisms of the Department of Commerce administration of the IANA contract. You want it to be more inclusive um, of uh, the broader community. You want it to maintain the, um, the multi-stakeholder nature of it, that it's really about the technology implementation of the internet and don't allow it to be clouded by politics. And so those are some of the things that we discussed today, and those are some of the things that are most important for the IANA transition, that they maintain those key performance parameters. All right, we're gonna do our closing statements just to wrap it up here. There's so many issues that, uh, whether it's from the governance, uh, or the threats, or the opportunities, I mean, we're talking a lot about threats, we know the limitless opportunities, and we don't wanna give that short shrift. Um, one of the issues we didn't talk a lot about, though, obviously, was politics and the, the, the role that it plays. Look at the, what happened in the Arab Spring and the role that people sort of had hope that uh, what role Internet plays in terms of more repressive regimes and, and, and how it's actually been used effectively by some and less effectively by others, how it might not be the tool for freedom or some movement towards globalization or toward democracy. It seems to have become a much more complicated picture than people first envisioned when it was more of a kind of tool. So as a closing statement, we've we covered a lot of ground and maybe uh, I'll start, maybe I'll start with uh, Moaz, I'll start with you this time. Just a closing statement on, as we peer ahead, the great challenge in the future and what you think the, the most profound challenge going forward uh, that you might be dealing with from a governance point of view or that uh, where you see the challenges for governance of the internet playing out? I think we, you know, for example, I will state about Tunisia. Tunisia was the first country in Africa to be connected to the internet. It was in 1991. But at the same time, we experienced a very, very heavily censored internet, and we lost a lot of opportunities about that. So I think this, the message and the lessons learned by Tunisia is that we lost a lot of opportunities because we didn't promote openness of the internet. We didn't promote freedom of expression on the internet. And this is really, very important because Tunisia actually is a member of the coalition of Freedom Online and also is promoting in this region, in our region, this is an important issue for the development of the internet. So the challenge is how to keep this openness and how to safeguard our achievements of, the, of, uh, of, of Freedom Online and at the same time, how to remain secure. Because you know, a lot of people, actually in my country and the different places throughout the world, stating that the internet is bringing terrorism to different countries. And we talk about ISIS, we talk about a lot of security concerns. And at the same time, how to solve these issues in a global manner with cooperation within different and innovative ways and different approaches, and by, and by maintaining also the freedom of expression and freedom online. Right, all right, uh, Melissa, I'll, I'll go with you. I mean, there is that old, that old debate, is it a force for good or a force for, for bad? You just don't know. What concerns do you have going forward? Well, over the course of the next five years, I see um, sort of a confluence of events that uh, keep me up at night. Um, you know, first, we're, we're going to be moving from 40% of the population being connected to the internet to at least 60% of the population being connected to the internet, which is a great opportunity. But at the same time, we're also moving from each of us having three IP uh, connected devices to having at least 15 connected devices, yeah. all of which are vulnerable and all of which are going to be likely exploited for crime, mostly. So how do you, as you're connecting your citizens and they're having more and more of these devices, and I'll give you just a kind of a simple story. I was traveling from Washington to New York a week ago, and I was me and my two children, and I have a car that's in 
IP mobile device, because you can't buy them without the internet connection. They each had three devices associated with it. So my car, going from, New from Washington to New York, had a minimum of 10 IP devices associated with it. That's kind of scary. Um, and I'm a Wi-Fi hotspot that could you know, be moving lateral you know, <laughs> weapons across the, you know, the country. So how do you think about these things? And, so, and then what kinds of control or mechanisms do you reduce the risk and re encourage or restore resilience? And those conversations start to challenge our notions of sovereignty, of prosperity, and it's causing our leaders to be worried and implement and talk about it more. And then it causes maybe more tensions and conflicts because we don't all see it eye to eye of how we need to move forward. All right, uh, excellent. I, I just hope you're not using those devices while you're driving. All right, go ahead. Uh, Lafa. Well, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to end on an optimistic note, if I may, because what I've seen is the tremendous transformative power of the internet and how this interconnectedness has opened up doors for so many people in developing uh, countries. I've seen how the use of social media has transformed the political process. You know, we've talked about repressive regimes, we've talked about the fact that there can be regime change, that you know, certain movements can be boosted, but it, it can also be used in a very transparent and open manner as during the recent elections uh, in India. The intelligent use of social media really engineered a political uh, change. And with India aim to becoming, I mean, the, the aim is for India to become one of the leading users of the internet. So I think for a developing country, the educational yeah. and developmental benefits that you will get from the internet sure. is perhaps uh, uh, the greatest concern. I think if we can bring those benefits to more of our people, if we can leapfrog into the, uh, into the technological future, to me, uh, how we achieve that keeps me awake at night, not the threats. I really want to achieve that. Yeah. And I think that's a positive aspect which we have to emphasize as well. You could uh, just do a whole section. That's excellent. You, you, we could do a whole discussion on that Indian election, as you say, when you, yeah. you, you glossed over it saying it, it's, it's social engineered a profound change. Yeah. What a fascinating story that is. is. And, and yeah. I mean, for another day, but a, a, yes. a fantastic story of the role yeah. it played there. Carl Bill. No, I agree with very much with that. I, I, I think that the technological evolution that we are in the beginning of is tremendously good for the world. It, it, is, it does empower individuals. It does create new opportunities for nations, for development, for freedom, for all of the values that we stand for. There are problems that we need to tackle. Exactly. No question about that, because I said, uh, the net is a reflection of society, and there are good in society, mostly good in society, but there's also evil. We handle that in the offline world. We need to handle it in the online world. But essentially, it is a fantastic revolution for the good that is going to be to the benefit of free and open societies like ours, but eventually to the benefit of all of mankind. Carl Bill, Melissa Hathaway, uh, Latha Reddy, and Moaz Chakchuk, I thank all of you. Uh, one thing you seem to all have in common is none of you seem to sleep at night, which I think is excellent. Uh, and I think now uh, some of us might either get a better sleep or a worse sleep, depending what, what you think. But I, I, I really uh, appreciate it. Can you please give them a round of applause? <laughs>And let, my, <laughs> let me add my thanks to uh, the panel, but also to Evan for conducting a, a very interesting discussion. I think it's clear that you have a, um, a difficult <coughs> task ahead of you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and your, uh, and your panel. Uh, I think, though, that we all are impressed with the intellectual rigor you are bringing to it and the energy you're bringing to it and the importance you are giving it. And I think that we have uh, a confidence leaving here uh, that we are going to have uh, progress at least as we go forward in the next two years. And I, I thank you, A, for coming to Canada 2020 and CG. And I thank you too for taking on what is a very <laughs> important and let's face it, a very difficult task. So thank you very much.
Now, before I let you go, um, if you like this Canada 2020 event, well, there's one tomorrow, too. In this very hotel at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon, uh, Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley, who is going to be, although some people may think it foolhardy, he is going to be a candidate for the Democratic Party nomination for president in 2016. And he is going to be here tomorrow, and we are having a 2020 event with him beginning at 4.30 right here in the shadow. So I hope you can make that too. Thank you very much. Good night.